Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. There's a number of causes that are particularly near and dear to my heart. As many of you know, children is one, food is one. Another one, truthfully, is Alzheimer's and dementia. My my father, whom I love to death and who was one of my heroes of all times, as I'm sure was the case for many of you as well, uh, passed a couple of years ago after a five-year bout with Alzheimer's and helping to end that disease and ensure that no other families have to suffer in that way is something that is particularly close to me. And so today I'm particularly honored to welcome to the show, Samantha Sayward, who is the Senior Walk Director for the Alzheimer's Association. Samantha, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about your organization and the walk. What's your 30-second elevator pitch? So uh, the Alzheimer's Association is a leading volunteer health organization in Alzheimer's care, support, and research. Our vision is a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Um, The Walk to End Alzheimer's, um, which is what I oversee, funds our mission and is held in over 600 communities across the country. Our event brings thousands of people together to rally around finding a cure and ending this disease. So that's my elevator space pitch. Now, tell us a little bit with regards to the walks. Can you describe a walk? What is a walk to end Alzheimer's? A walk to end Alzheimer's is an event where you come in and you realize that you're not alone. So um, depending on where you walk in Philadelphia, we're the largest walk to end Alzheimer's of its kind right here. Um, And you walk in and you see a sea of flowers. So we have four flowers that represent why people are walking with us. So you see blue, purple, orange, and yellow. And really it is symbolic of yellow being caregiver. Um, You're currently caring for someone. Blue is if you have Alzheimer's, purple is if you've lost someone, Um, and orange is if you're an advocate for a world without Alzheimer's. Um, So when you walk in, you see the promised garden, it's really symbolic of our mission. Um, And it's just a fun event. So we'll, you know, we have food trucks and uh, sponsorship booths of of our corporate partners um, and also our national teams. And, you know, really, you get to meet other people that are impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia, learn a little bit more about what we're doing in the community as far as research, um, support, and care. Um, and, you know, we have a, a 15 minute ceremony where we share stories of each of those flower representatives. And then we walk um, in Philadelphia, we walk around Citizens Bank Park and um, which is you know, the, the baseball stadium. Yes, it is the baseball stadium at Citizens Bank Park where the, you know, um, Phillies play. So we get to go in their stadium and and see that. And um, we really prop up other people's stories um, as part of our our events. So um, that's a little bit about, you know, what the experience is. It's cathartic for people um, to come out and realize they're not alone in the fight to end Alzheimer's. So it is literally a, an event where people are gathering together. It's a fundraiser where people are walking collectively, yes. thousands of people coming together all together for that uh, for that common cause mission. Yes. And they have all of those symbolic um, experiences while they're there as well. Yes, exactly. That's really beautiful. What's your favorite part of doing that? Honestly, it's talking to... Um, our, our walkers and our corporate partners, you hear a lot of stories on walk day and realize that there are so many people impacted by this disease and every story is unique and different. I was actually just at a walk in Wilmington and I got a really great opportunity to speak with a family who had just lost um, their father and they had all these shirts you know, that, that were symbolic of what he would say. Um, and it's really just beautiful to see how families come together and, you know, take something that's completely devastating on their family system structure, um, and financially impact, uh, devastating, um, and really see them take ownership and control of it. Cause you know, I'm sure you can relate that when a family member gets Alzheimer's or dementia, you lose a sense of control. Mm -hmm. And the walk is a way to give that control back to the family. So interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it is. It's so devastating as, as really any illness can be, but that uh, opportunity to come together for 
for community and any sense of control is always welcome because that's yeah the first thing that you lose to say the least and in doing this and by the way you said how many walks are you coordinating across the country every year it's over 600 i think oh. right now we're at 670 so all the way out to california to texas to florida so if you um you know live in the the u.s oh we even have in hawaii you know if you live mm -hmm. in the united states guaranteed there is a walk in your neighborhood wow so do your research and, and find your local walks there is something yes. out there for you whether you are someone who immediately in your family who has suffered from alzheimer's or extended family friends other loved ones anybody any connection you have or just because you want to help definitely yep. look for those uh, for those local I, I won't call them races but for those local events now in doing all of this what's one of the biggest issues of the day and how do you have to adjust your pro your approach when you're talking to different key stakeholder groups about it yeah so um I think it's really connecting with the corporate community and for them understanding the value in partnering with the walk to end Alzheimer's is really a challenge. Um, finding that internal, we call them internal company champion that will really be the voice internally to say, you know, we should have a conversation with, you know, a staff member uh, at the Alzheimer's Association to discuss partnering with them on the walk to end Alzheimer's, it can be really challenging to, you know, cause there's a lot of other nonprofits who have equally as important missions, you know, cancer, heart, uh, lung and lymphoma, you know, there's so many, especially in the, you know, larger cities that are trying to connect with these C-suite level companies. Um, so we definitely have the challenge of being able to find that company champion and connect with them and, and then be able to articulate the value of partnering with us on, um, you know, the walk to end Alzheimer's. And what's the difference between understanding that, of course, nowadays, donor dollars, I mean, I guess throughout history, donor dollars are something that have been a, a hot commodity, as it were. It's, it's yes. something everybody is competing for, even more so now in the, we'll call it post-COVID era. But how is it different to approach the corporate sponsor prospective partners um, to get them to donate their money versus the individual out there who also has money to give just in smaller quantities, potentially at least. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very different approaches, but the, the mission remains the same. Um, so we are articulating to both parties that we're, you know, we're in the business to end Alzheimer's and you can be a part of that. Um, and, but with the corporate community, it's really communicating with them how it's a good business decision for them to partner with us. Um, because it will impact your bottom line is, you know, really what we say, you know, we leverage our statistics, but just saying that it will impact your bottom line, it will impact your business. Um, and it probably already is, you know, we know that caregivers are in the workforce and you know that leads to uh being unproductive because they are caring for someone at home um you know all these things we have statistics to show that there is you know impact on the workplace so that's you know what we try to communicate to the corporate community but really there is with the constituents or the walkers um it's really around rallying behind a cause that has impacted your family, whether you're a caregiver or whether your loved one has passed um, and raising funds to fund research, support and care. So, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen, you know, to the next generation. Um, so two, two very similar missions that we still push. It's just different in how we articulate it. You know, the, the corporate community, really, we, we want to give them an opportunity to raise their, you know, community presence. Um, Whereas, you know, our friends and family teams, it's really, you know, rallying behind a cause and bringing the whole family together um, around the walk. Sure, sure. The people don't tend to realize how much of an impact that those kinds of uh, challenges can have from the business level as well. You understand the personal yeah. impact, but when it's second and third, if your employee may not be suffering from it, but they're employee their their care they are the caregivers to someone else um, right the, it's it's amazing how really destructive that can be to productivity to focus to even availability 
to attend show up absenteeism presenteeism all those kinds of things there is a there is really a, sincerely a bottom line impact to yes. that if whether or not you're participating in finding the solution right absolutely now in doing this and in trying to identify these the perfect corporate sponsors and other collaborators partners etc who's the toughest audience you ever had to get through to and what did it take to finally break through yeah, that's a great question. We had a, a health system that, uh, again, they're being approached by so many people. Um, and I was honestly like, how do we frame this conversation differently? How do we get this person to, you know, sponsor us for more? Um, and so we can fund our mission. Um, and so I took the approach of, um, taking this relationship as transformative and not transactional. I think that a lot of what does that mean to, to making a relationship or a discussion transformative, not transactional? That's a great phrase. So what did that look like in your situation? Listening is uh, key to making a relationship transformative. Um, and how did you I do believe that? that? Yeah. So, um, Basically, what what I did was is I sat down with the person that was in charge and I asked discovery questions. You know, what is your goal for the year? What is your goal? You know, this year, five years, 10 years down the road, what is your what are you all focused on right now? What is important to you? You know, how do you prop yourselves up in the community? How do you like to be propped up in the community? Like if it doesn't fit into our model, how can we find a way to make it fit? Um, because I, I always, you know, there, there is always a way for us to work with a, a corporate partner, whether it's volunteering, whether it's, it's sponsorship, whether it's just rallying employees around a cause and, and improving morale, you know, there's always an opportunity. So I really asked those questions and I listened and that took that relationship from, instead of being like putting my hands out and saying, Hey, we would like corporate dollars. And then just, you know, um, not really talking to them for the rest of the year. It's really working with that sponsor and listening to them and then following through. Um, and we have a year long campaign at the, at the walk to end Alzheimer's, you know, we start from January one up until December 31st mm -hmm. and working with that, that person checking in every month saying, Hey, we did this, uh, you know, benefit for you because you communicated that diversity and inclusion was super important to your organization. This is what we did. Um, and this is how we propped up your, your company. So it, it's, it's just taking that relationship, um, to a different level. Yes. Yes. The depth and the, the understanding on a very different level, what's in it for you, what's in it for yes. us, what's in it for the individual or the, the organization now in, in doing so, or in, in any other context for that matter, what's an important lesson that you learned when you went from being an individual contributor to leading your first team? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I was in the Navy for five and a half years on active duty. Oh my and goodness, thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, so I really honed in on a lot of my leadership styles and communication styles from the military. Um, and I have a really a funny story. So um, I was uh, you know, in, in the field of being a, I was a hospital corpsman. So, um, I was trained to be a medical staff member and I had the opportunity to get, uh, fine tune my training in physical therapy. So I became a physical therapy technician for the latter part of my, um, my military career. And I, um, because I was stationed somewhere else and I went to training and then I was stationed somewhere else, I kind of had a chip on my shoulder. You know, I, I assumed that because I was a higher rank and I had all this experience that I would immediately get respect. Um, and I walked into, you know, the physical therapy clinic where I was going to be working for, you know, the next three and a half years, just, you know, bossing people around and telling people, you know, what to do. And the new sa the um, sailors that were there who were lower ranking than me, you know, bossing them around saying, you know, I'm the new guy in town um, and this is how things are going to be. Um, and surprisingly that did not go over oh, well, <laughs> totally surprising, totally surprising. Um, and I wasn't well liked or well respected, you know, and I think I thought it was, oh, it's because I'm a woman and it's, I'm in a male dominated field. That's why I'm not getting respect. Um, and I just didn't have that 
self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And um, then when that sailor was leaving that duty station, um, leaving Connecticut, he gave me some really blunt feedback. And I, you know, I was talking to him about how, you know, how challenging it is for me. And, you know, I don't really feel like anyone respects me. And it's because of all these things. And he was like, look, it's because you came in, you didn't listen to us. You kept bossing us around and pretending you knew everything when you didn't know anything. Um, And that I think is a, is a really large pitfall of anybody starting in a new role is coming in and trying to change things and being the new guy in town um, or new woman and not listening to your staff members and learning. Um, That was a huge learning lesson that I had to learn the hard way. It sounds like you, but you learned it and that's important. It's, and it's good that you had someone on your staff grants that he was on his way out, which I guess gave him the the safety <laughs> yeah. to be able to to give that feedback without fearing repercussions, but to really get someone who will be point blank direct with you and say, what you think is your problem isn't your problem. Here's your yes. problem. And here's what was self-created and here's what you can do about it. You know, that's that's a gift in its own way, even though it doesn't exactly taste like a gift in the moment. It, it's hard, it's hard to get that type of feedback. But I think if you take it as an opportunity to be self-aware, I think the best leaders I've ever had were very self-aware, were very aware of their weaknesses and, um, you know, their skill set and were took feedback very well. You know, I told you about my dad in the beginning and one, I think the best career and really life advice that he ever gave me was right at the very beginning um, I was a teacher in right mm-hmm. out of college for a few years. And my, he had been a teacher for 40 years. That was his career wow. in middle school. And um, I remember asking him when I was getting ready to take my first class, to take on my first class, to leave my first class and saying, dad, no, how do you get the kids to respect you? Cause they all, every time I'd visit his school growing up, they all, all the kids would tell me how much they loved him and didn't matter whether I was 10 or 20 or how mm-hmm. old it was. He always seemed to, to have, they always loved him. And he said, you know, Laura, you can't just demand respect. You have to command it with your presence. And I didn't really understand that when I was, what, 22, 23, something Mm -hmm. along those lines. But boy, has it sunk in. And the idea of not just, and it sounds like that you were a perfect example of that, where you walked in and assumed the title was something that should just demand it. And you could verbally just demand it and tell them to respect you. And they should somehow behaviorally respond accordingly. And uh, we're always surprised when that doesn't happen. And especially in the military, you have a rank, you know, and you assume that, oh, because I'm a I'm a second class, third class, and this is specific to the Navy ranks, or Mm -hmm. I'm an officer, you have to respect me. And that is is such a pitfall of a leadership quality that you learn the hard way, even in the military. Or if you don't learn it in the military, you will learn it in the civilian world because, you know, respect is not given, it's earned. So, um, you know, you can follow orders from someone who outranks you, but yes. it doesn't mean that you respect them, right? There's a difference. Absolutely. Between, as I say, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. What does it mean to officially, uh, you know, minimum check the box requirement, quote unquote, respect someone versus actively, right. internally, personally choose to, right. to have a feeling of respect for them? That's a very different world, isn't it? Yeah. And I, that's what this, what my staff was like back then is they, they checked the box, they respected my rank, but they didn't respect me as the individual. Huge point of distinction. They respected the rank, respected the position, did not respect the person with the rank. Yes. Really, really mission critical change. Uh, Now, so that brings us to our listener 24 hour influence challenge. And this is an opportunity for you, Samantha, to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours in order to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? So um, I would task everyone with um, asking your employees in my communications with you, what would you like me to do more of, uh, less of, or differently? Mm, Okay, so a nice, straight, very specific question. Ask everybody the same question. Let's say say it one more time. What are the what's the multiple choice options of sorts that you're giving people? One question. So, what would you like me to do more of, less of, or differently? Okay, and I think that's really powerful because to when we if we ask a 
question. If we ask feedback, especially of direct reports, somebody who, and we ask too vague of a question, Mm -hmm. it sounds really scary and really super risk intensive. Like, gee, what, right. what exactly should I bring up? I, yeah, what do I want more of from you? Less of from you? I, can I tell yeah. you what I'm really thinking? Mm. <laughs> or like, let me phrase that. If, if, do I, if you don't ask me that specifically and you say, what should I do differently? That can be scary. But to say like one thing I should do more of, one thing I should do less of, fewer emails or you know, more bullets in the email or yeah. whatever it happens to be. I think that helps people to narrow, at least gives them a multiple choice to choose from and will help you get more, the more specific, I've always found the more specific the question, the yep. more specific the answer you'll get. And a vague Absolutely. question, you'll get a very safe, very generic, very yeah. non-substantial answer in return, which is like, okay, what was the point of that exercise? Right. And I think it fosters a, an environment where your staff feel comfortable with providing you feedback, and that's going to make you a better leader. Um, in the long run. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, you really do have to condition people to do that even as yep. well. Then now we, we talked about a mistake that you've made. What about accountability? Tell me about a time when you've had to address an accountability issue with someone on your team. How did you approach it? How'd they respond? Um, how did it go? Yeah. So I had a uh, really um, challenging example for, for, uh, you know, for this question. So, um, and I think it's about being accountable to your actions, um, is, is the example I'll go into. So, um, I had a staff member who I always, you know, we had a roller coaster of a, of a relationship. We're very, we were very close in age. Um, I think that that had some influence over it. Um, and I think, you know, my, you know, maybe, my communication style wasn't her preferred communication style, but I think, you know, overall we were, um, we worked very well together as a team. Um, but there was an event that was happening. Um, and I play sports on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I, I create a really clear, um, boundary between work and my personal life. So, you know, I work nine to five, um, and I try to really sign off and create that environment for myself to unplug. And I think that's super important, but of course, you know, as, uh, in our season, in our walk season, you know, I do work a lot more than just nine to five, of course. Um, but really on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I try to make it clear to my staff that I am unavailable, you know, um, and I have communicated that, um, and she happened to plan, um, an event that was celebrating volunteers um, on a Tuesday that I couldn't attend. Um, For whatever reason, she accidentally left me off the calendar invite. So I didn't find out about it until that Friday. Um, And it was just too short notice for me to be able to get, you know, a substitute um, for, you know, for the game. Um, And it just so happened to be a championship game. So it was obviously super important for me to be there. Um, And it so come, you know, come that event, I didn't attend, um, but this my was a super- walk event, when you talk this about was it a, event? it was a post walk event. So it's okay. a, it's celebration party for volunteers, just saying, thanks, you guys are amazing. Um, you know, and bringing them together, you know, giving them some goodies, feeding them that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, uh, it obviously was very important to me, but I didn't find out about it last minute. And I also had you know, there are certain situations where, of course, if you can't go to something, having another staff member go in your stead, and my supervisor was actually going to it. So I was like, great, you know, there will be representation from leadership there. Um, You know, so and I I spoke to my supervisor and said, hey, look, I'm not there because of this reason, you know, and, you know, not sure why she scheduled it on this day, but it is what it is. I still want, you know, the, the I still want there to be representation there. So my supervisor did go. And, um, while they were there, my staff member was telling the volunteers that I chose my sport over them and mm-hmm. said it actually to my supervisor said, you know, Sam's not here because she chose dodgeball, which is the sport I play, mm-hmm. um, she chose dodgeball over volunteers, mm-hmm. which is absolutely not true super offensive. And I took it very personally. My supervisor came to me and said, 
you know, hey, you know, this person said this about you and you really need to um, confront her about it. And um, and I, I had to absolutely take the bull by the horns and just be very, you know, very clear and honest with, you know, being able to confront her. So after the event, I, you know, the next day I just asked to speak to her, you know, one on one. And I said this was brought to my attention um, and absolutely inappropriate for you to say that to volunteers and make me look really bad, you know, and, you know, you work so hard on, on the, on the walks and in development and fundraising, um, to have, especially someone that you feel like you have some type of, you know, kinship with friendship with who's in the, you know, who's in the trenches with you, um, and making these events happen to, to say that was just, I took it so personally. And, um, but I tried to be really, um, clear about the facts instead of how, you know, um, than bringing too much emotion into it. And, you know, um, because externally it, when a staff member is talking about colleagues or their supervisor, no matter if it's true or not, it just doesn't look good. You know, it, no, it it takes down the whole organization at that point. It ruins the, the, the image at that and the reputation. That's a shame. It's a smear campaign. Right, exactly. And it, and it's trying to make me look uh, a way that I'm not. So I just approached her and I said, look, it's not okay for you to say this. I, you know, I am a very transparent leader. If you have any issue with anything that I do, you know, I do and, and I encourage all my staff. I want you to be blunt and honest with me while being respectful mm-hmm. <laughs> and give me that feedback and say, Hey, Sam, it was important for you to be there because of X, whether or not, you know, our supervisor was there or not, I wanted you to be there. And, you know, if she had said that and, and really drilled home that like, it was important for me, Samantha Sayward to be at this event, I would have been, you know what, absolutely. I will be there. And I would have, you know, made that decision then. Um, but it ended up being that way. She was not responsive to my feedback. She just went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. And then she said, anything else? And I was like, I guess not. <laughs> and and hung up the call. Um, and, it, you know, it hurt my feelings. And I think, you know, I was very, you know, as, as you know, I'm not some robot supervisor, you know, I do, you know, get, you know, it does hurt when someone is saying that and you hear about it in any regard. Um, but she ended up calling me after, after like an hour, I think she sat with it and realized like whether or not she did feel that way, it was not okay in the way that she approached it. Um, so she did apologize and we really, we moved on past it. And I think we had a pretty good relationship, um, you know, moving forward, but that was, that was a really hard conversation, but I had to hold her accountable. I mean, you can't, you can't say those things. You can't be out in the community like that. And um, so, yeah, I know that was a long response, but. um, Well, and it's, it's twofold, right? Because on the one hand, yes, it makes you feel bad. That hurts your feelings that that she would be that personal and she would trash your, your reputation to all the people that you'd worked so hard to, to to corral and to get them to do this kind of work in the first place. Volunteers in particular are hard to come by and they have to feel connected if they're going to continue to show up. They're not going to want to volunteer for someone who they think is a bad person. Right. Um, But it's also just markedly inappropriate, unprofessional. And, and I mean, in a lot of organizations that's termination worthy. So I would think there's a lot of stuff to, uh, beyond yeah. just, do you want to, you know, ha- why did you say it? Or it hurt my feelings. There, there's the, the professional aspect as well, which yeah. um, was, I'm assuming something that was discussed and equally difficult to address. Yes. Yep. So then uh, well, it's good that it was uh, with time, at least, and not too much an hour that she was able to come to her senses a bit, call you back and say, uh, yeah, that's- yes, because other steps would have needed to be made. But I think taking ownership of your actions and holding yourself accountable, I think was why it was able to be resolved. Yes. Yes. Now, in if somebody in the organization wanted to move up to have a senior leadership role, aside from technical expertise, what's something that they'd have to demonstrate and why? So they would have to demonstrate a willingness to say yes to new opportunities. I know in the Alzheimer's Association, we have so many committees you could be on, so many opportunities to um, jump on trainings, to develop yourself as a leader within the organization. 
Um, if, you know, in general, in the nonprofit space, just developing those skills within the organization is, is really, in my experience, how you grow. Um, I think internally networking, you know, we, I work for a really large organization. So I know some, you know, might work for a smaller one, but really networking, you know, getting yourself out there, meeting other people uh, within the space and meeting other people in roles that you would like to go into, um, I think is a way that you can, uh, you can move up in the organization. And finally, as Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. What's one communication <laughs> pattern that's had a big cultural impact on, a, on an organization or a team that you've been part of, positive or negative? Yeah, I, I think leaders not being open and transparent uh, with their decisions. I think that that is key positively and negatively. Um, I think that, again, like just going back to getting getting clear and concise uh, feedback from your direct reports is really important and being open to that feedback, I think is, is really important. Um, in the military, there is no openness about why decisions are made. Mm -hmm. Decisions are made. No one explains it to you. You know, you are going to, you're going to have to, you know, line up in formation at 5 a.m., to get a dress inspection. Why are we getting a dress inspection? Because you're told to. So it doesn't foster an environment where you feel comfortable in bringing up issues to your supervisor or, you know, enjoying just working for a company or organization. So, you know, my entire military career was just following directives without knowing why. So, you know, when I became, when I became a leader, I was like, I am as, you know, you can, you can't be totally transparent about everything. You know, there's some HR stuff that you can't, you know, but I want my staff members to know I made this decision because of X and it was thought through and it was thorough and transparent in that process. What a huge contrast going from the military where transparency itself has really no bearing and is almost frowned upon when you it think is. about yep. it in part, you're, you're preparing for battle where there's often no warning, no nothing. It's just, we need to react. We don't have time to right. question these kinds of things. It's, it's quite literally life or death in, yep. in many of those worst case situations. So to go from that to where everybody wants to know why, and everybody expects full explanation yep. and needs to know what everybody has an opinion. Is. That's for sure. That's for yep. sure. So, I bet that was a big cultural co shift and a little culture shock for you coming out of the military and into civilian and in particular nonprofit work. Yeah, it was a humbling experience. I think in general, separating from the military is really challenging. I mean, they don't, no one prepares you for it. I don't, I think that they purposely don't prepare you for it. If I'm being honest, you know, you get a week to transition into the civilian workforce and it's a complete culture shift. Like you said, it's and on so many different complex levels, um, but really going from a very, you know, this is why, you know, you do this and you don't ask questions, you know, um, and then going into the civilian world and having to really start at the bottom. I mean, I worked as a temp as my first job in the nonprofit space. Um, whereas I was at E5, I was in charge of a department. You know, I was a command fitness leader. I led big fitness group exercises. You know, I was in charge of a lot of things in the military. And then when I got out, I was a temp. Yeah. So very humbling experience. Um, and that's why it's listening first um, and, you know, learning always, you know, I could have come out of the military and been like, I was in the military. I, you know, have all this experience and, but I learned, you know, the listening first and, um, you know, trying to, to, you know, go from there. So. Yeah. If So Samantha, then if you could give one piece of advice to any uh, newly transitioned veteran or to anyone in the military out there, who's listening to this podcast and is getting ready to uh, transition or is, is contemplating it? What's one piece of advice you would give them? Yeah, that's a good one. I think it's really, really important for you to be kind to yourself. And I know that that might not be like, that maybe sound very military. I know, I know, but that's, but that's the thing is that when we 
separate from the military where like, I have all this experience, you should want to hire me and then you don't get hired or you, mm. you, no one's looking at your resume because you didn't make it civilian. You didn't make it you legible. Didn't translate for, it. Right. You didn't translate it correctly. Like no one knows what being a command fitness leader means if they're not in the military, we know what it means, but how does that correlate to the job you're applying for? Mm. So it can be really demoralizing and really humbling. And I wish I was kinder to myself. I wish I'd been like, you know what, Sam, you know, it, it keep trying, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. I was just beating myself up. Like, how could I not be hired? Look at me. <laughs> you know, like yes. I have my degree. I was, you know, I was at E5 when I separated, you know, I was all these things in my head and I just wasn't kind enough to myself um, in the process. But there are so many resources out there for transitioning, like also for transitioning military people. It's just knowing where to find it um, and taking advantage of all those resources. There's so many, but the military is not going to tell you about mm. those resources. Cause so where can you find out about them? Where if there's for somebody who needs to, who's going to need to take advantage of those resources, where can they go? So, um, they can go to their local veteran service organization. So it's called VSO. Um, okay. so if they type into Google VSO, they can get set up in their local city with their local veteran service officer or organization. So there's team red, white, and blue. Um, they're an awesome organization that they don't, necessarily help with transitioning but they do help connect you with local veterans in the community that can be your support system um, but just important. yeah absolutely so just searching veteran service organization and there are so many of them yes yes so it sounds like there's twofold uh, on the one hand emotionally be kind to yourself and if things don't transition as fast and smoothly as a little more a little rougher road along the yep. way that's okay be patient with yourself but also be sure to have somebody help uh, just logistically speaking re revamping your resume so that it sounds civilian oriented and not military yes. so that people can understand why they should hire you and how awesome right. you are and that uh, the resume needs to be transparent yes Absolutely. Not just the conversation is terrific. Well, then, Samantha, how can people learn more about you, the Alzheimer's Association, and walks? Yeah. So, uh, the easiest way to find out anything about the Alzheimer's Association is going to alz.org. Uh, right there on the screen, you'll see the walk to end Alzheimer's. Um, if you want to go directly to the walk page, it's alz.org slash walk. You type in your zip code, you find your local walk near you. Uh, walk season is almost over. However, we start ramping up for the 2023 walk to end Alzheimer's starting January, uh, probably around January 5th or six when the website's open, but the Philadelphia walk is November 12th. So if anyone listening would like to join us, you know, on Saturday, November 12th um, at Citizens Bank Park, um, they can find us at alz.org slash walk and type in, you know, Philadelphia. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn. So just Samantha say word. Um, and that's how people can find me and connect. Terrific. Well, Samantha, this has been so much fun to talk to you and to learn about you, the military, about Alzheimer's uh, opportunities to to help end, I should say, Alzheimer's and otherwise just to have a conversation with you. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And to everybody else out there, thank you, as always, for listening in. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode if you haven't done so yet. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, Stitcher, your platform of choice, so we, we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And of course, finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sacola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communicating secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sacola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. 
The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.